Africa. Welcome to Daybreak Africa from the Voice of America. I'm James Barty in Washington. Today is Thursday, February 2nd, and here are some of the stories we are covering. South Sudan and Somalia rank most corrupt countries in the world. What you have in South Sudan really is what we call a kleptocratic regime. A kleptocratic regime basically in simple layman's terms means a rule by thieves. Liberia and two other African nations are classified as significant declining countries in the latest Transparency International Corruption Perceptions Index. But the government says the report does not accurately reflect progress made. South Sudan prepares for a visit by Pope Francis. U.S. launches initiative to support African farmers amid food security challenges. At a time when Africa is experiencing historic weather extremes and as population growth is increasing, we see a real opportunity promoting soil health and climate-resistant crops in Africa. And Zimbabwe plans to build a $60 million cyber city to replace Harare. Those stories and more are coming up on Daybreak Africa. An analyst says corruption is rampant in South Sudan because institutions that ensure accountability in government do not work. This follows the release of the 2022 Transparency International Corruption Perceptions Index, which ranks Somalia and South Sudan as the most corrupt countries in the world. Brian Adebat is Deputy Director of Policy at Enough Project. He tells me corruption is rampant in South Sudan because the country is ruled by a kleptocratic regime. Well, I would say that South Sudan is still at the three bottom levels, at the lowest level of the of the ranking. While it has gone up from like being the worst, like it brought up the, the rare end last year, right? Number 80 or 85 or something. Now it is two steps. It's like 178 out of 80. Somalia now is like ranked as the worst. But that's not a consolation. Not a lot has really changed in South Sudan, and it's nothing to celebrate. The story to take away from here is that it's still one of the, the three most corrupt countries in the world. So that's not a consolation or, at all. South Sudan is a new country, and uh, why is it that corruption has been so rampant, according to this report? Why? Well, elites that established government in South Sudan embarked on a corruption spree when um, they gained independence in 2011. And so what you have in South Sudan really is what we call a kleptocratic regime. A kleptocratic regime basically in simple layman's terms means a rule by thieves. So by that we mean that the mechanisms that are supposed to offer accountability to check government officials against uh, stealing government money. Those mechanisms do not work. You know, the institutions like the Anti-Corruption Commission, they don't function. The National Audit Chamber, they don't function. And so what you have is a free-for-all looting spree that benefits a few in government. And this is fundamentally the problem in South Sudan at the moment. South Sudan is supposed to be going to elections probably sometime this year. What, what role do you think corruption might play in running the government or even running an election? Corruption basically means that the entity that is in control of government resources right now and which the political party that is ruling right now because of the lack of mechanisms to arrest this corruption, it means that this party is going to have an advantage that none of its rivals would have. It would have access to resources, state resources. And this means then that the playing field, the election playing field is going to be uneven and it's going to advantage one party here. And we have seen that there have been no steps taken to arrest this corruption. For instance, the peace agreement notes that one of the problems that led to this conflict is corruption. And therefore, in the peace agreement, there is actually a whole chapter dedicated to institutional reforms to make the institutions that are supervising government to be effective so that they can control this corruption. But as we look at the implementation of this peace agreement, the parties to the conflict, and notably the government, has focused on the power-sharing stipulations and the reunification of the army or so-called security arrangements. But Chapter 4, which is the chapter that deals with institutional reforms, that chapter has not been touched as we speak, and we're going forward to the elections. So that's a problem right there. That was Brian Adeba, Deputy Director of Policy at Enough Project. He was speaking with us from Washington, D.C. 
Pope Francis arrives in South Sudan tomorrow Friday for his first visit to the world's youngest country, which is struggling to quell unrest that has displaced more than two million people, Shilaponi reports from Juba, South Sudan. <laughs> The Juba Catholic Church Choir practices a song they wrote to welcome Pope Francis on his first visit to South Sudan. The streets of the capital Juba are being repaved and buildings repainted to greet the 86-year-old leader of the world's nearly 1.4 billion Catholics. Paul Onyege is a chief administrator for President Salva Kiir's office. Onyeng said almost 90% of the work has been done and the few days remaining will be for review. 60% of South Sudan's 11 million people are Christians, most of them Catholics. Father Samuel Abe is leading the team preparing for Pope's visit. We would like to, to see that the, the, the visit of the Holy Father will bring us more blessings blessing of a blessing that we have already so that we as people of South Sudan in turn will coexist and live together as brothers and sisters. The Pope is expected to hold an open air mass at the mausoleum for Dr. John Garang who led South Sudan to independence from Sudan in 2011. Francis will also meet some of the country's two million internally displaced people who fled ongoing unrest. IDPs who spoke to VOA hope the Pope's visit will encourage peace. Nyakom Korwal Deng, a 43-year-old mother of three, lives in Juba IDP Camp Number 3, with more than 25,000 other citizens seeking safe shelter from conflict. She told me through a translator why the Pope's visit is important. You say, uh, as a mother, we are very sad because now it is both sides. If there is any fighting take place, the children are being kidnapped and they are gone for good. The Pope is being joined by the leader of the Church of England and the Church of Scotland moderator in what the Holy See is calling a non-denominational pilgrimage of peace. Archbishop Justin Badi Arama is head of Church of England in South Sudan. Their presence in Juba, maybe it is a way that God is visiting us to reverse and minimize all our challenges and also to enable our leaders to have that stronger spirit of uh, trust for one another, that spirit of giving themselves to implement the remaining parts of the revitalized agreements which are not yet implemented. Francis arrives in South Sudan after visiting the Democratic Republic of Congo, which the Vatican says has the biggest population of Catholics in Africa. Emmanuel Adil Anthony is the governor of South Sudan's central equatorial state, which includes Juba. We have informed our people to be ready to receive the Pope from uh, the airport on the date of arrival from uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. That the President of the Republic have announced that this year, 2023, as the Pope is visiting us, will be a year of peace and reconciliation. During his three days in South Sudan, Pope Francis will also meet President Salva Kiir, who is expected to brief the pontiff on peace efforts as well as the country's ongoing humanitarian crisis. Sheila Pony for VOA News, Juba, South Sudan. You are listening to Daybreak Africa on the Voice of America. I am James Botti in Washington. Today is Thursday, February 2nd. For more Africa news and features, visit our website at voaafrica.com. Connect with us on all social media platforms. We are on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram.
The executive director of the Center for Transparency and Accountability in Liberia says President George Weir has failed to lead the fight against corruption and to end the culture of impunity for corrupt government officials. This followed the release of the 2022 Transparency International Corruption Perceptions Index in which Liberia, Lesotho and Mali are classified as the significant declining countries on the scale. Liberia declined by six points over the last five years in West Africa. Anderson Miamen says President Weir must lead by example in the fight against graft by going after alleged corrupt public officials, including his confidants, by investigating and prosecuting them. He tells me that the president must also make sure that anti-corruption agencies are fully funded. The report is not a good one for Liberia. It shows that the government of Liberia is not doing enough to fight against corruption. To the extent that Liberia has declined by 15 points on a CPR since 2012. Over the last five years, on this administration, we've declined by six points from 32 in 2018 to 26 in 2022. You said that uh, President George Weah should lead by example. The government or the president would say, well, what can I do? I suspended officials who were implicated in corruption. I mean, what else can the president do? How many officials did he suspend, by the way, if I may ask you a rhetorical question? What we've seen so far is a lack of commitment from the president to actually deal with corruption. For example, the U.S. government sanctioned three officials of the Wiala government since the U.S. sanctioned the then Minister of State for Presidential Affairs, the head of the National Police Authority of Liberia, Mr. Bill Twawe, and the former Solicitor General. The government of Liberia has not taken any meaningful steps to seek the support of the U.S. government to the base of our recollection to investigate and prosecute those people. We're saying that two things have happened over the last five years under the George Wale administration. Much of what we can allude to will basically be efforts to pass a few additional laws, for example, the instrument on whistleblowing and the one on witness protection, amendment to the code of conduct. These are things that have happened over the last five years for the most part. But all of the investigative reports that the Liberal Anti-Corruption Commission completed, especially over the last one year, to the best of our recollection, there's been no action. You mentioned the independence and sanctity of integrity institutions. What's your view, first of all, on the performance of the Anti-Corruption Commission Bureau of Liberia? The Anti-Corruption Commission has been making some efforts over the period, and I must commend the current chairperson and even those who have headed the commission and what with the staff over time to do what they've done. But for the most part, they've been making some efforts. The challenge we have had over time is actually giving uh, the LSTC and the other public integrity institutions the resources, moral support and others so that they operate at full capacity. And so much of the problem we have in Liberia right now rests with the presidency. I mean, the, the legislative branch of government has its own part to play as the direct representatives of the people. But as you know, in Liberia, this is not what we want, of course, but the reality is we have an imperial presidency. The president wields a lot of influence. And so what the president does is important in setting the agenda for the fight against corruption. What we also need is administrative sanction. We need the president to act to suspend people and dismiss them where necessary when the evidence is so glaring that certain shady things have happened. Anderson Miamen is the executive director of the Center for Transparency and Accountability in Liberia. He was speaking with me from the capital, Monrovia. Liberia's Minister of Information, Ledger Hood Renan, says he believes the 2022 Transparency International Corruption Perceptions Index failed to fairly reflect the progress that the administration of President George Weah has made over the last 18 months in the fight against the problem. The report classifies Liberia, Lesotho, and Mali as significant declining countries on the index. It says Liberia dropped six points over the last five years in West Africa. 
Minister Rennie says the administration has passed new legislation which gives the Anti-Corruption Commission prosecutorial powers. He also tells me the government has made available more funding for the agency to do its work. First, James, let me say that uh, we have not had time to review the full report, but given the issues raised in the report about Liberia and its performance, I think the report has not covered a fair reflection of many of the, the progress we've made in the last 18 months as an administration in trying to ensure that the fight against corruption takes on a new meaning and a new amplification in the country. Legi, what progress have your government made? Firstly, we have changed the legislation with respect to the anti graft Commission, the new one, the Liberia Anti-Corruption Commission. There's a new law in place then that provides for the entity to have prosecutorial powers of its own, also to the commissioners and all of the people working there will no longer fall under the ambit of the executive powers of the presidency. They cannot be fired by the presidency. Neither can they be influenced by any political influence coming from the executive to all the legislative branches of our country. This provides for them to do the work without fear of favor. I must also say that uh, for the first time in the history of our country, we've made more money now available than ever before for the anti graft Commission to be able to carry out its programs and do its work without fear of favor. And we believe that the crafters of the recent report did not take into consideration what we have done as an administration to ensure the fight against corruption takes on a new meaning in our country. Legi, this is what people say. No matter what law you pass, you are not putting on trial the people accused of corruption. Those who are making those claims are themselves now okram with what the old law has said. The old law that gave the anti graft Commission its powers said that when the Graft Commission investigates an individual who they believe must have abused the public trust, the report should go to the Justice Ministry, who should then review the evidence provided by the anti graft Commission and see whether they are in line with the legal ramifications of our country and see whether the evidence is sufficient enough to carry people to court. Most often the time there's been a disagreement between the Ministry of Justice and the LECC in the conduct and execution of their responsibilities with respect to the fight of graft. And remember, the legislations were not done by the current administration. We came and met it on board. Now we are changing it to say, look, there will be no need for the anti graft Commission to go to the Ministry of Justice to validate its report before those who are found culpable by the LHCC can be taken to court. So, um, Legi, we're talking about sufficient evidence. Late last year, the president suspended these three government officials, senior officials, who were sanctioned by the U.S. Treasury Department, and uh, an investigation was supposed to take place. So what happened now? How far have you gone with the investigation? The Ministry of Justice is seized with the authority to do that. I cannot speak to that matter because of the ramifications and sensitivity of the issues involved. But let me say this much, James. Remember, Liberia didn't accuse these people. It was our international partners, the United States, that accused these people. And if evidence is not available to prosecute, it's difficult. Thank you, thank you so much. A pleasure speaking with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, James. Ledger Hurenin is Liberia's Minister of Information. He was speaking with me from the capital, Monrovia. In partnership with the African Union, the UN, and others, the U.S. State Department kicked off an initiative to help African farmers and governments to prepare for and adapt to food security challenges caused by climate change. Viewers Maria Mandiallo has the story. U.S. Special Envoy for Global Food Security, Dr. Kerry Fowler, launched the new program Wednesday at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington. Crops adapted to climate pest diseases and the needs of the marketplace are a prerequisite for food security. Poor soils don't produce rich harvest. Fowler, who recently visited Zambia and Malawi, warned there is an urgent need to develop crops that are prepared to withstand the effects of climate change and the agricultural productivity demands of Africa's growing population. At a time when Africa is experiencing historic weather extremes and as population growth is increasing, we see a real opportunity on promoting soil health and climate-resistant crops in Africa. By the end of the century, as you probably know, Africa will be the world's most populated continent, yet already there are 300 million people who are food insecure on the continent. 
He said that historically, most adaptation efforts have focused on a handful of crops, such as maize, rice, and wheat, but that attention should include other lesser-known crops that are rich in vitamins and micronutrients. Other crops, such as um, grains, such as sorghum and millet and teff, many of the legumes, almost all of the root and tuber crops, and the hundreds of traditional and indigenous African fruits and vegetables have received much less attention. Not surprisingly, their yields are low and their potential has been unrealized. For many of these crops, there has never been a single scientifically trained plant breeder working on them in all of agricultural history. This initiative is being launched in partnership with the African Union and the UN Food and Agricultural Organization. Ambassador Cindy McCain, U.S. Permanent Representative to the U.N. agencies in Rome, was at the launch. She said in a moment of overlapping crises, armed conflicts, COVID-19 and climate change are straining global food systems. And that is affecting everyone, especially the more vulnerable around the globe. Throughout my travels as the U.S. ambassador to U.N. agencies in Rome, I've seen the effects of conflict, water scarcity, and extreme weather conditions from Kenya to Madagascar, from Sri Lanka to Laos and more. As global leaders sought climate solutions in COP27 in Egypt last year and at the Negev Forum in UAE last month, it is clear that we must leverage science and technology and innovation in agriculture to feed a growing population. And it demands a united global effort. Fowler said in addition to FAO and the AU, other entities such as the Rockefeller Foundation, Columbia University, and the CGIAR are also involved in this effort. He said this is like a potluck dinner where the State Department brings some resources and maybe a main dish, but other partners need to contribute to the effort in order to make it a success. Fowler noted the process outlined is part scientific and part consensus and commitment building. Mariama Jalu, VOA News, Washington. Zimbabwe plans to build Zim Cyber City, a modern capital expected to cost about $60 billion in raised funds and include new government buildings and a presidential palace. Critics are blasting the plan as wasteful when more than half the population lives in poverty and the government has let the current capital, Harare, fall apart. Columbus Mavunga report from Mount Hamden in Zimbabwe. The Zimbabwe government says the community of Mount Hamden, a 30-minute drive from Harare, will be the site of Zim Cyber City, which will replace Harare as the capital and relieve some of its congestion. Some of the construction is expected to be completed by year's end. Monica Mchangwa is Zimbabwe's information minister. Obviously, we are building the cyber city because there's a market for it. There are Zimbabweans who can actually afford it. And we want our Zimbabweans, even those in diaspora, this is time to come back home. They can't continue to see the high-rise buildings in, in, in abroad and not in Zimbabwe. Some Zimbabweans in this farming area can't wait for the project to begin. 24-year-old Brighton Mutambara hopes to benefit once the project takes off. He says when construction starts, we will be employed for some jobs. Others have already started building nearby, hoping to cash in by providing accommodation for the $60 billion project that UAE-based firm Mauk International is helping develop. But some Zimbabweans want President Emerson Munangagwa to first address the country's economic problems and dilapidated power and water infrastructure. Plus, thanks to Chinese investment, a six-story, $140 million parliament building has already been built on the cyber city side as a gift to Zimbabwe. Columbus Mavungam for VOA News, Mount Hamden, Zimbabwe. And that's it for this Thursday, February 2nd edition of Daybreak Africa. We thank you for being our guests this morning. I am James Barty in Washington saying, have a great